I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Nicaragua. Today, we've got more viewer questions, and in theory, I had some beautiful light, and then a storm rolled in as I tried to record. So, we're going to hope for the best. At least we got the, the hat light going on. Let's check it out. We've got a couple different questions, one about passports and how they work. We're going to be talking about finding a lawyer when you're here in Nicaragua, and uh, we're going to be talking about credit cards and just some financial, maybe, discussion, not necessarily related to travel, but a lot of times travel or relocation will bring some of these things up. So we're going to be tackling some viewer questions. Sorry, I've got to do some videos from the office, but I think these turn out pretty well. So happy to do them. Let's get to it right after the bump. Okay, so excuse me looking off to the side, I'm reading some of these questions, but I'll try to look at you when we're actually talking. Okay. Uh, hi, Scott. This is from Chris Fry, 9584. Could you do a video on why some passports are stronger than others and what makes up the decision? Why we need visas, e-visas, visas on arrival, and so forth. Okay, so the way that passports work is there's not a universal system. It's not like there's one giant passport registry and, and it all goes through a single system. Each country issues their own passports. There's a little bit of standardization that the United Nations has taken care of, so they're all the same size, they flip the same way, like that stuff everyone's agreed on. But much beyond that, they've not. So in order for you as the citizen of country A to travel to country B, your country and that country have to have come to some kind of agreement more or less. Chances are they're going to have embassies in each other's country. For the country you're going to be visiting, B in this example, they need to want you to come into their country. Now, they could just open their borders and say everyone is available to come from anywhere. We don't care. We just, just come on in. And there are countries that act that way, but they are few and far between. In most cases, they want to get something for allowing someone else's residence to come in. So if you're in country A and you want to visit country B, country B wants to maybe be able to visit country A as a kind of, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. So since they're going to let you your people in, they expect you to let their people in. This is very common. The United States and the EU, the Schengen Zone, made a deal to do this very thing, where the United States has to allow in EU citizens, EU has to allow in American citizens, short of specific cases, like it's not completely blanket, but it, without visas. Now, the US has not honored their agreement, so there's a lot of uh, uh, anger about that, That uh, and so the EU has started to issue the need for visas for Americans to go to Europe, but they had a deal where they were supposed to treat each other equally, and they basically are treating each other equally again, just not in a positive way. But all regions that are doing uh, visas and doing passports are working this way. They are generally not giving access to people from another country unless they're getting something for that access. Or if they're going to do uh, some permissions and they don't have uh, good relations with that country or they're not getting something for allowing those people in, then they're going to use the process to either uh, up security, like they're going to spend more time, or they're going to use it to generate some revenue. So for example, as an American, when I visit Bolivia, Bolivia and the United States do not have close relations. They're just not going to let people from one travel to the other. And this makes sense. The U.S. is definitely not letting most Bolivians visit the U.S. So why would Bolivia let most Americans visit Bolivia? Anyone who does this is giving other countries an unfair advantage that one country has the power to go everywhere and people from other countries just don't and so one country has a big business advantage travel advantage all kinds of things so it isn't behooving people uh, countries to be un unnecessarily open while it may seem like isn't being open really good yep it may be good for you as a travel destination but tourism doesn't generally generate that much revenue in your economy. Normally, other things are much more important, and just allowing people in and not getting something in exchange for it may overall hurt your economy or not provide the benefits that you're hoping for. So that's why a lot of countries just don't do that. So when I go to Bolivia, Bolivia has a visa process by which I have to pay $160 to be able to enter Bolivia. Now, it's good for 10 years, it's multi-entry, no big deal, and I have that visa, it's a handy one to have. I can go around South America without any problem. I can just go into Bolivia, I'm already pre-approved. But I've gone through extra screening, I've done some extra paperwork, and I've paid my fees. So they know that even if I spend no money in country, even if I do nothing, they've still made a few dollars and they've covered the cost of letting me in, and they've shown Americans that, hey, the U.S. could be letting Bolivians into the United States and maybe this would go away. It's a reminder that your country is not reciprocating the allowance that this one is giving you. 
So most of these situations simply arise from countries that are not super friendly. They may not be unfriendly.、Um, in some cases, for example, I live in Nicaragua, and there are many countries in Africa that have a very difficult time getting visas to come to Nicaragua. This is not because Nicaragua doesn't want those countries to come visit. It's because there's no flights that go directly between. There's very little potential traffic, even if flights were to be offered. There's extremely few people going back and forth, and the process by which you make those deals with the different governments to have an ex. Change of uh, 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 police records and、uh, criminal records and different things that matter for these countries.、Uh, Takes time and money, and if you're a small country and people are coming from a small country, it may not be financially advantageous to put anything into place to make it easy to go between them. They may love each other. It may be countries that are ideologically aligned. They may get along really well. They may want to share resources. But if there's simply no traffic between them, why would either one of them expend resources to make it easy for two or three people to go in between? It doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense when you have a lot of traffic. So here in Nicaragua, we have a lot of Uh, these kinds of agreements with the CA4, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala that are right there. We have a lot of agreements with like Mexico, Costa Rica, Panama, our local neighbors. Plus, while we're not super friendly with places like the United States, we do have an awful lot of、uh, formalized. Paperwork in place so that if you're going from one to the other, you certainly know what's going on. People will put in the effort to know exactly what needs to be done, what the requirements are, what you have to get permission to ahead of time, and so forth. So while they may not be、uh, the most open, they are very formal, and they do have formal relations, and they do speak back and forth, and have kind of a you know relatively similar process, or they're knowingly making it different when they do. So it's、uh, only. Generally, places in the region. Now, Nicaragua does have very special visa arrangements with Spain, for example, but not with, say, you know, Greece. Why not Greece? It's just far away. There are very few Greeks who want to come to Nicaragua. Can they? Absolutely. But is there a special thing where they went out of the way for them? No. It's just not not very much traffic. And how many Nicaraguans want to go to Greece? Very few. Can they? Of course. But again, they're not making a big special thing. Now, Greece is in the Schengen, so it's relatively easy. But any place that's like that, right? Kosovo. If you're not in the Schengen zone and you want to, you know, it doesn't matter how ideologically aligned you are. It doesn't matter how friendly you are. It doesn't matter how much it would make sense for people to want to go from one place to another. You just have to have a certain amount of traffic before you go through that effort. So, in most cases, Chris, when you're looking at why are there these things, it's because the actual idea of people moving between countries is kind of a weird, convoluted thing. And countries need to track you from a, a citizen standpoint. They need to know who you are, what you're doing. Are you safe?、Um, do you have enough money to, to stay in that country? Are you a good tourist or resident or whatever? They need to have some assurances that you're not going to cause problems or not going to disappear or whatever. And so, in doing that,、um, often they get that information from the country you're coming from. But if they can't do that, then they need some more heavyweight process like e visas, visas on arrival, and so forth. To make that make sense, and so that is often what happens. But in the example of Africa with Nicaragua, we have a new situation that just arose that the Algerian embassy in Nicaragua has just opened. So in theory, there's going to be an easy way to go between Nicaragua and Algeria, which sounds crazy because there's definitely no flights going between them. But we can hope that maybe in the future there's a, there is a flight that goes between them. But if you're going from Nicaragua to Honduras to Spain, you can go on to Algeria, which you can do. There are ferries,、uh, and you. Would be able to get your visa pre-approved here in Nicaragua, so that you can go do that. And Algeria is a sensible place for Nicaraguans to want to go vacation. It's exotic, but. Affordable for Nicaraguans, and it is accessible through a path that is potentially possible for many Nicaraguans. So it makes sense for Algeria to potentially think this is a good deal, but it is certainly still going to be a very small path going between them. But that they have opened formal relations with embassies between the two countries is really promising. So that, that's pretty cool. But that is why passports are the way that they are, and why you need all these different things, and it's different for everybody from every country. It's because literally every combination of one country to another is a unique situation that is negotiated individually. All right, we're on to our second question from Dale Kurtz. I like these videos of how people fail. Now, these are talking about where we do a breakdown, a po post mortem of people who've moved to Nicaragua and then decided that they didn't want to stay. What made them move in the first place and then 
give up, right? Because it's not like people who investigate. We had someone did, did we talked about the other day. They were here to investigate. That they investigated and find that found that it wasn't the place for them is perfect. That was a success. They did a successful test and determined that this was not the place that they wanted to be. But in the two examples that Dale is talking about, the people actually moved with the full intent and full investment in a full move and immediately within a number of days knew that they had completely misjudged what they meant to do and had not done adequate research. And so we dug into these to see what had they done wrong, where did they not give it enough chances, where did they not do the right research, and so forth. Uh, not because they failed, but to hopefully learn from the mistakes. That's the idea. On a semi-related note, how does one go about finding a reliable, reputable lawyer when you first come down? I know you said not to trust expats for a recommendation since they probably got their recommendations from another expat and have no real basis to judge their reliability or veracity. And if you've just uh, been there a few weeks or a month or so, you might not be able to develop a deep trusting relationship with the Nikas you've met to trust their recommendations. Not to mention that maybe the average Nika might not use lawyers that much and maybe not for searching a rental since it seems like Nikas don't move as often as expats, which is definitely true. Um, at least that's my assumption. It's correct. I mean, I couldn't tell someone here in the U.S. which lawyers are good. I don't use them unless I'm in trouble. And thankfully, I haven't had to do that for many decades. I'd rattle off the ones I'd seen the most ads for if someone asked me, which is exactly, that's one of the big challenges. Uh, so yeah, I'm thinking that walking around the city looking for abogado signs and meeting them till I find one, it probably isn't the best way. Also, when meeting with a lawyer, should I try to find an interpreter or rely on imperfect Spanish to get by? Thanks, as always, for great videos. You're helping people more than you probably know. Well, Dale, we talked about this a little bit on the live stream. You and I talked about it, but it's it, this is truly one of those difficult spots where it really is a lot like finding a good apartment. How do you do it? You walk around, you ask people, and it takes time and some trial and error. And unfortunately, that's not the best process, but what else is there? This is one of those spots where I think people will be best served by simply getting the hard truth of this is one of the things you do to find yourself successful or not successful is putting in time to get to know people and find a really good lawyer. Now, when we came down, we asked for advice from uh, friends who had long-term business here in the country, and they were able to recommend some lawyers. And honestly, they were fine lawyers. Are they the best? Are they the ones that I would like, yes, these are the lawyers? No. But did they do the job that they needed to do? Yes, they did. Did they rip us off? No, they didn't. Did they charge us a reasonable amount of money? Yes, they did. Did they get everything perfect? No, but it wasn't bad. Right. And so having a good Nicaraguan business resource. So in all these kinds of things, if you're going to get recommendations, one of the first things is make sure you're getting it from a reputable source, which you talked about. Right. Expats are almost universally going to be really bad sources. Now, if you have an expat who does a load of business, is obviously doing a lot of legal stuff, has a lot of connections, is very well, you know, integrated into society and, and is routinely being successful in things that they do, they may have those resources for you. But it's going to be very unlikely. It's going to be an exception within the expat community, not the norm. The average expat is going to be just randomly doing the same thing you talked about in the United States. Well, this is who showed up at my door when I got here. I didn't judge them. I didn't do enough work. I didn't evaluate them in any way, but they did the job. And so I'm recommending them. They were fun to hang out with when we had a beer. So I'm recommending them. And that is okay as long as you know what you're getting into. Well, it's a starting point, but it's important to understand that if they're not evaluating lawyers, they're not testing out a bunch of them. They're not, you know, setting some criteria to test against. They're not evaluating how good the work is. Then their recommendation is for all intents and purposes worthless. It doesn't mean that the person is bad. It just means that the recommendation of them has no value. You can't, if they didn't actually evaluate them, what is it that they're recommending? Well, this person breathed, seems like he's a lawyer, right? And that's, that's a really dangerous thing. So we just had this situation where someone down in San Juan del Sur, hired a lawyer. It turned out, I don't think they're actually even a lawyer. That's quite some thunder we just had. I don't think that they were even a lawyer. And um, I don't know what they, so the person said, no, they're definitely a real lawyer, but I don't know how they proved that. Maybe they did, but it sounded like they actually weren't they were a lawyer, uh, then we have not yet heard what action they took against them because they broke the law, should be disbarred. And um, so it's important. We're waiting for the story to end. But if they're 
doing what they should be doing just ethically. They should have taken legal action against these lawyers that I don't think are really lawyers because they were not acting as lawyers. They're acting as con artists. Lawyers aren't allowed to do that. Now, lawyers might do that, but they're not allowed to do that, right? So you have to, we all have a responsibility in society to protect each other from these things. And rather than hiding identities, right? Look for people who are hiding identities. Oh, something bad happened. I'm not going to tell you who did it. That's not a reliable story. If and even if it did happen, that's not behaving well. If if you know of someone who's a criminal and is out to hurt people, you got to protect people. It is not okay to hide that, right? Now maybe you're being threatened or something, but uh, you know, within reason, people need to be warned. And if someone is create is is uh, posing as a lawyer and doing real damage both uh, to individuals and to the country's reputation, it is important that legal action be taken against them and not just look the other way way, right? This is not a joke. This is real harm to real people and uh, should not be taken lightly. So definitely evaluate when you're talking about exactly how people are recommending people, how the stories that you hear of lawyers, what exactly is being said? Because the stuff we hear from the expat communities often is enough to be like, well, why would you have recommended that lawyer? Like clearly something is wrong. So I think to when you're going to find a real lawyer, like the chances that you're going to find it through the expat community, very slim. And what you probably want to do is, is, you know, find people in your Nicaraguan community and see who they recommend, people who are business people, people who are uh, professionals, doctors and, and other lawyers and such. Who would you use? How much do you use them? Look for people who actually use lawyers rather than uh, most people have a tendency to go for advice from people who have never used those resources, who know nothing about it. And we see this in American business all the time. Well, I go to this other business owner who knows absolutely nothing of what they're doing, and I asked him what he's doing for something. And he didn't evaluate that thing. He knows nothing about it. He doesn't know if his is working or not working, good or bad. He just knows that's what he's using. You don't ask him to evaluate it because that would be insulting, because it would be obvious you're calling him out for not doing a good job as a CEO or an owner. No, instead you say, what do you use? And just use that as a recommendation, even though that's not a recommendation. If anything, it's almost an anti-recommendation. This guy's not very smart. He probably got tricked into something, but we're going to see what he's using. And that should be generally something to avoid, if anything, not something to pick. If you then pick it, ooh, why? What what went through your brain to make that set of connections? Uh, but if you find people who are, and this is what we did, right? We found successful business people in Nicaragua who, you know, knew people in different regions and and we avoided places with lots of expats not just not getting recommendations from expats but not getting people who spoke english or targeted expats a lot of lawyers will speak a little bit of english but not like spoke english right um and not with a website not going after expats anything like that you want to avoid but overall it's going to be hard right you're gonna have to sit down and talk to people you're gonna have to try them out on a few things and over time develop relationships and that's really what we did over time things come up right oh you want to buy some land you want to buy a house start with some simple stuff and see if your lawyer can handle it and see how they handle it incorporation paperwork maybe dealing with a car maybe dealing with immigration or whatever work it up until you have a good relationship and if you determine that they're not in a good relationship uh position move on to another one and evaluate someone else the same way. And when you find one that's good, hang on to them, right? It's going to be a very important thing in your life, right? You really want to have, even if you're not using them very often, um, you know, get together every few months and have a beer, if nothing else. Make sure that you are keeping those resources um, close and, and knowledgeable of your situation and able to help uh, at a moment's notice. And the same in the United States. Now, it's, I think it's easier in a lot of ways. Finding that perfect lawyer may be much harder, but finding a good one who's going to you know follow the rules is, I think, easier because it's it's just much a more formal process. Uh, in the United States, though, you know, it took us a long time to find a lawyer that we really liked. Now that we have one, we've stuck with them for years and they know our situation. So anytime we need anything, we just send them a note. They know exactly what's going on. They have records of all of our stuff. They have teams of people that can help us. They have the resources. They have the skills. And, and we've, we've developed that, right? And so coming to Nicaragua, we did the same thing. We put in this time to whittle through a number of different legal resources and found a legal team that we are exceptionally happy with and, uh, and, and now we're like family. Right. And so it's uh, very important, I think, as an expat, not necessarily Nicaragua, not necessarily anywhere, but imagine an immigrant going to the United States and you're, you want to be living in the United States. What's the most important person in your, in your, you know, circle of, of, of 
connections is going to be your lawyer, right? That's who's going to be helping you with every little situation that comes up every time that something bad happens to you. Because as an immigrant, like we are, you, there's always that moment when you might be the target of something. Like this story that was in uh, on YouTube recently that everybody's been talking about, right? They were the target of a scam and they didn't have a good lawyer. They needed a good lawyer immediately. They needed a good lawyer, first of all, having, if they already had a good lawyer, none of the bad things probably would have happened. If they had access to a good lawyer, even though they didn't use them initially, they probably could have fixed a lot of the things quite quickly, right? There's a lot of, like, when something goes wrong is not when you want to be putting together your legal team. You want to have a legal team that is there for you. And when something goes wrong, you call on them. They already know who you are. They already know what your priorities are. They already know what kind of person you are. They already know what you need. And they're going to be there for you uh, in an immediate capacity. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, Dale, walking around and looking at Avogadro signs, while that is not actually the process, is closer to the process than anything else is. That's almost what it's going to be like. Uh, and, and it's going to be tough. But And it's going to depend where you are. Um, you probably want a lawyer that's local unless you live near an enclave. Then you want to stay away from them and then go to Managua, go to Leon, uh, get someone from one of the big cities, and uh, you'll get better luck that way. I hate that there's no good answer for some of these things, but sometimes there isn't a great answer, and this is one of them. All right, on our final question is from Andrew O'Neill. We're back to credit cards again and personal finance. Hey, Scott, thanks for continuing to pump out amazing information. What I'm wondering is what about the people who have opened so many credit cards, and let's just say you only use like maybe three or four of them at the most regularly, and you don't really feel like opening another account because you really feel like you should be closing some of those accounts that you don't really use. However, that's going to affect your credit uh, history, which affects your score. Do you have any thoughts on that? I was thinking of getting the Hilton American Express and the Spirit MasterCard travel card uh, for Spirit Airlines, but I'm a little concerned opening up two more credit accounts when I already have so many of them. Can you touch on that? Uh, yeah, so I think in general, having a lot of accounts is not the negative that people imagine that it is. There's like this huge feeling that you can't have a lot of accounts. And while you don't want to go out and intentionally have a lot of accounts, it's not actually a big deal the way that people kind of portray it. Uh, in reality, having a lot of accounts is perfectly fine. Um, rarely does it really hurt your, your scores. What does is closing accounts. That will hurt your scores. So for example, I have a credit card that I haven't used in years. Do I close it? No. I also don't carry it or make it accessible. It's all locked down. It's at zero. It has an auto pay just in case something happens. I do get an email every month just so I know that there's no activity. Hasn't been any activity in years, but I keep an eye on it. It looks good on my credit. It's no big deal. It it doesn't count against me in any real way. It does count towards my total credit availability. That's a little bit more of an issue, but it's not a big one, at least for me. I don't have so much credit that, that they're like, whoa, you have way too much credit. Uh, I opened, because of this very discussion, I opened several new accounts last year, and my credit score skyrocketed, actually, which was shocking to me. Um, but I opened a new, a new American Express, a new MasterCard, and a new Discover, and I almost feel like there was another one, but I got quite a few new ones all, I did get Discover, but I'm not sure that was at the time, um, all in a single year, and uh, it, 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 my score did much better. And all you do is take your old cards and stop using them. Oh, I did. I, I also got a secondary uh, uh, Bank of America card. And what I did was um, just took all my old cards, Put them into a drawer, put them into a safe is really where you where to put it, or destroy them. But you you probably want access to them as emergency cards. And um, for me, it was I didn't have very many cards that were international. They all had transaction fees and stuff. So I, all of those, I basically said, okay, here's a pile that these are worthless to me because I'm never going to need to use these. I want international cards. So I took each one and I replaced it with an international card, but I didn't close a single account. It just wasn't worth it. So for example, I have two credit cards with Bank of America, and they're just like, whatever. And one I use, one I don't. It shows up in the same thing when I sign in, so it's really nice. Oh, I owe on this. If I was to owe on the other one, it'd be right there on the screen. Never really comes up. But once in a great while, I go to a website. It's already got the other one saved, and I'm like, whatever. $7, and it shows up at the end of the month, and I just pay it off. Not a big deal. And in fact, I think that looks better on my credit report because there is activity on those cards, and they're just being paid off every month. Um, so I think in general, what I would say, Andrew, is just don't, um, don't worry uh, about it in that way. Don't worry about the number of accounts. Um, I, I think that's that's something that people 
who aren't studying credit tend to focus on, and it's generally irrelevant. Credit is a complicated beast, especially when it comes to credit history and reporting. Uh, and if you're gonna be living abroad, of course you want a good credit score. I'm not saying that it's not important, but it's not nearly as important when you live abroad as when you live at home. When you live in the United States, everything is based on credit. And when you live abroad, very little is. But having the right credit cards can do a lot to making your life better, and having the wrong ones can just be really painful. Uh, uh, and, and why bother? Um, I'm sure you'll be better served having the right credit cards for what you're going to be doing uh, than having fewer accounts open. Just closing accounts, generally not great. If you are going to close an account, make sure you've maintained it at zero with absolutely nothing late, nothing ever bad for a really long time before closing it because you don't want something negative like a late payment being locked in on your record that you can never get rid of or basically never get rid of because it's a closed account with something negative hanging on it. So very strategically close accounts, but the easier thing, just keep them open. Uh, and, and then if you ever need them, they're there for you, which is not not a negative. Just resist the, the urge to make them overly available. Uh, thanks for joining me. Hope that answers your questions. Uh, like and subscribe if you'd like to help support the channel. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller, and I will see all of you tomorrow.